Okay, in this video, we begin our next unit, which is on oscillations. To some extent, we've already described oscillations. We did so in our unit on energy transfer. So for example, if I take this vertical oscillator and I set it into oscillation like so, recall that we have the transformation of potential energy, spring potential energy, and gravitational potential energy in this case, and it's being transformed back and forth into kinetic energy as the object oscillates. If the object oscillates without any heat loss, this is called a simple harmonic oscillator, and the object itself is executing what is called simple harmonic motion. So once again, to some extent, we've already described this in the context of energy transfer. But what we did not do back in that unit on work and energy is we never went through the kinematics of this type of motion, that is describing position, velocity, and acceleration as functions of time, nor did we go through the dynamics of this motion, that is understanding how F equals MA when we apply it to such a situation gives rise then to the kinematics of a simple harmonic oscillator. That's what we're going to do here in the opening lectures of this unit. Okay, now let me go ahead and tilt the phone back towards the boards. Like so. Let me tilt it upward as, upwards as well. Okay, there we go. Okay, so now we begin this unit on oscillations. Okay, for those of you that are enrolled in Honors Physics AB and in AP Physics C, this is Chapter 14. For those of you enrolled in Physics AB, this is the first half of Chapter 11. So the first thing that we seek to do is we seek to understand the kinematics of a simple harmonic oscillator. Now recall that a simple harmonic oscillator is abbreviated as SHO. The motion itself is called simple harmonic motion, which is abbreviated as SHM. So what we seek to describe is the position, velocity, and acceleration of a simple harmonic oscillator as a function of time. This can be done, very strictly speaking, by using the methods of calculus. You'll see a little bit of that in this lecture. But in addition to that, we can actually develop the kinematics equations of simple harmonic motion algebraically by comparing it mathematically to a very similar type of motion that we've already seen, and that's actually uniform circular motion. So to demonstrate, what I'm going to do is use this turntable here. And then I have, for example, this red object here that is taped to this turntable. Let me go ahead and spin this up then to uniform circular motion, like so. So recall for an object in uniform circular motion that it is moving at a constant speed in a circle. When you look at uniform circular motion, however, you're looking at a two-dimensional type of motion, motion that takes place in a plane. What we're going to do is we're going to just take a look at one of the components of this two-dimensional motion. For example, say in terms of this demonstration, in the vertical direction. So now what I'm going to do is take the turntable and point it towards my phone like so, and now take a look at the vertical component like so of the red object taped to the turntable. Notice that the vertical component here of the red object looks very similar to what we saw earlier with the mass attached to the spring. So basically what we can do mathematically is take the two-dimensional uniform circular motion, break it into components, and then just look at one of those components. When we do, what we're mathematically modeling is simple harmonic motion. Okay, so let me move this off to the side. Okay, and then for SHO kinematics, what we seek to describe is position as a function of time, velocity as a function of time, and acceleration as a function of time. We'll do so by comparing simple harmonic motion to uniform circular motion. So we'll find these expressions. by comparing simple harmonic motion to uniform circular motion. So once again, basically what we do is we take the two-dimensional motion of uniform circular motion and we just look at one of the components. Okay, so let me go ahead and erase this and let's begin this mathematical development. Okay, first of all, in terms of picturing it, even though I was demonstrating it vertically, let's just assume that the, the oscillation itself occurs horizontally on a horizontal frictionless surface. 
So here is, for example, a mass attached to a spring, like so. Right here is the equilibrium position. And as we've already described in the context of energy transfer, the oscillation occurs about the equilibrium position, like so. Okay, now let me go ahead and draw out a circle here. Like so. And then the center of the circle here corresponds by definition to the equilibrium position of the oscillation. Okay, let's assume that the oscillation here occurs along the x-axis, like so. So the oscillation occurs along the x-axis. And then therefore the oscillator itself is oscillating like this about the equilibrium position. Okay, the maximum displacement of the oscillator from equilibrium is referred to as the amplitude that corresponds to the radius of this circle. This is called capital A. So capital A is the amplitude of the oscillation. This is the maximum displacement from equilibrium. Okay, once again, that corresponds to the radius of this circle. Okay, now by definition, let's say that at times t is equal to zero, the object is right here at its maximum displacement from equilibrium on the right-hand side of my diagram. And then we release the object from rest and it begins to oscillate like so. Let's say that sometime t goes by and the oscillator is right here. Right here, however, is what we seek to describe. We seek to describe the position x of the oscillator here as a function of time. We'll do so by mathematically modeling this in terms of uniform circular motion. In terms of the uniform circular motion, let's assume that the object is moving counterclockwise on the diagram. Therefore, that means that on the circle, the object is here, and then what I construct here on my diagram very simply is a right triangle, that is like so. Where right here, the hypotenuse of that right triangle is the amplitude A of the motion. Once again, that corresponds to the radius of the circle. Okay, let's go ahead and define an angle here on this diagram, like so. Let's define this angle as theta. And then therefore, right off the bat, just in terms of this right triangle, notice that the adjacent side of the triangle, which is describing the position x, is equal to the hypotenuse multiplied by the cosine of the angle, like so. However, which of the two quantities on the right-hand side of this expression is a function of time? Is it the amplitude or the angle? The angle is obviously a function of time, so then therefore we have to describe it as such. This is where we go back to our unit on uniform circular motion, and we recall the following definition, angular speed. And angular speed omega is defined as angle divided by time. It's how much angle an object rotates through per time when talking about, for example, uniform circular motion. We saw this back in our unit covering uniform circular motion and a couple of problems involving some kinematics. I haven't said much about it, however, since in physics A, or physics AB, that is, or in honors physics AB. Now it becomes important here. What I'm going to do is cross multiply the time t here to the other side of the expression to get the angle theta by itself. And then therefore, if I plug that into the expression here, and I'll end up with the following. A cosine omega t here as being equal then to the position of the oscillator as a function of time. The easiest way to see how this expression works is actually just to graph it out. And when we do graph it out, you could almost see that graph in terms of an oscillation. So let me graph out this function here on the lower board like so. Okay, so position as a function of time. All that I'm going to be graphing out here is a cosine curve. And that cosine curve, of course, of course, for math class, looks like this. Okay, now what I'm graphing out here is one complete oscillation. And this right here is the amplitude in the positive direction, which is to the right-hand side on the diagram above. And this right here is the amplitude on the other side of the equilibrium position. That's on the left-hand side of the diagram above. Okay, right over here is an interval of time or a moment in time where one complete oscillation has occurred. This is called the period. 
because mathematically it means exactly the same thing as the object completing one revolution in terms of the uniform circular motion. So right here is the period capital T. So the period capital T is the time necessary for one oscillation to occur. This is, of course, mathematically the same thing as the time necessary for one revolution to occur in terms of the uniform circular motion. We could also describe frequency once again. Recall that frequency is the inverse of the period. It's measured in terms of hertz. Back when we were discussing uniform circular motion, frequency was the number of revolutions made per second. Here in this case, it's just the number of oscillations that are made per second. And then these quantities, period and frequency, are related to omega, the angular speed, through the following expression. Omega is 2 pi divided by the period. In other words, you go through a two full 2 pi radians of an oscillation per one period, which is the time necessary for one oscillation. Incidentally, by the way, at this point, we really no longer refer to omega as the angular speed. And the reason for that is because that term corresponds to uniform circular motion. That's not really what we're describing here, however. Instead, we're describing simple harmonic motion. So for that reason, at this point, we rename omega. It is now referred to as the angular frequency. Okay, now getting back to what I said a few moments ago, this cosine curve is actually rather obvious. Under the right conditions, you can almost sort of see it. So let me go ahead and show you the demonstration once again, and keep in mind this cosine curve behind me when I do. So let me re-tilt tilt my phone. Once again, like so. Okay, now imagine doing this. Imagine taking the mass here attached to the spring and attaching this marker to it like so. And then as it oscillates up and down, imagine that there's a piece of paper that is kind of scrolling by in this direction like so, such that the marker writes on it. This type of device, by the way, is used in geology. It's called a seismometer, and it produces a type of graph that's called a seismograph, also called a seismogram. At any rate, however, imagine doing this in this situation by attaching the marker to the object like so, and then just watch one complete oscillation to occur. Basically, what would happen is that on a piece of paper scrolling in this direction, the marker would draw the position function exactly as we've described already. Okay, let me go ahead and retilt the phone once again. Okay, I'm going to move it upwards again like, that, like so. Okay, so now we've got our position function. The next thing to do, of course, after that is get the velocity function. All right, now in terms of calculus, we would get the velocity equation by just differentiating the position as a function of time. But here's how we can come up with the velocity expression by just once again making the comparison between simple harmonic motion and uniform circular motion. Okay, let me do some erasing here. Okay, now in terms of the uniform circular motion, at this moment in time when the object is here on my diagram moving counterclockwise, it has a velocity vector that is tangential to the circle. That velocity vector tangential to the circle looks like this. Okay, right here is a right angle, and this red vector that I just drew has a magnitude. Let's call its magnitude V0, just to give it a name. And V0 is gonna be the speed of uniform circular motion. However, that's not quite what I want. Instead, what I want to do is take this vector V0 and break it into components, and then we'll look at the horizontal component. Because after all, once again, recall that the oscillation is occurring horizontally here on the diagram. So let's go ahead and break this V0 into components like so. Here, and here, and then if you resolve V naught into the components as I've done, let me move this by the way, like so, 
If you resolve V naught into these components as I've done, if you futz around with the geometry, you can show that this angle right here is actually the same thing as this right angle theta. Okay, and then it's specifically this horizontal component on the diagram that we want that's along the x-axis. This right here is the V that we want. So now how do we get that V? Well, let's first of all just write it in terms of a component here of this right triangle. This is equal to the hypotenuse multiplied by the sine of the angle. Like so. It does, however, point to the left-hand side on my diagram, opposite of what we thought of as positive earlier. So then therefore I'm gonna give it a negative sign like so. And then what I have to do is take this component here of a V naught and I have to write it in terms of quantities that describe the simple harmonic motion. So once again, I'm gonna replace the theta here with omega t as I did before. But then I also have the V naught. What do I do about the V naught? Well, we need to write the V naught in terms of quantities that describe the simple harmonic motion. Here's how we go about doing so. Okay, recall that speed is equal to the circumference of the circle divided by the period. Back when we were talking about uniform circular motion, we saw the speed V as 2 pi r divided by the period capital T. Once again, the radius here in this case, keep in mind, is the amplitude of the motion. And then right here contained within this expression is 2 pi divided by the period, which is the angular frequency omega. So then therefore, I'm going to replace the V naught with A omega for that reason. When I do, I come up with the following expression for the velocity as a function of time. This expression right here. So once again, I've replaced the theta here with omega t, and I just replaced the v naught here with a omega. Now, for those of you that are enrolled in Honors Physics AB and in AP Physics C, notice what happens if you just simply take a derivative of the position here as a function of time. Take the derivative of the cosine, you end up with a negative sine. Take the derivative of what's inside with the omega t, and you pull out the constant omega like so. So this right here is nothing more than the derivative of this. Okay, let's graph out that function and relate it to the position function from earlier. Okay, so now here's a graph of the velocity as a function of time. It's nothing more than a negative sine function. So recall from math class that a negative sine function looks like this. And then once again, what I've graphed out here is one full oscillation. So this right here is the period. And then these points here and here on my graph are not the amplitude. And the reason for it is because we're not talking about position here. Instead, we're talking about velocity. It's the maximum value of the velocity, positive and negative, of this function. The maximum value of the velocity is the quantity a omega, positive here and negative here. Now here's how you can relate these two graphs together. You can do so qualitatively in terms of understanding the derivative. For example, on a position graph, the slope of the tangent line, the derivative is equal to the velocity. So now let me get a ruler. And then let's relate the two graphs to each other. So for example, first of all, at times t is equal to zero, the object is here at x equals positive a, and it begins at rest. So right here at x equals positive a, notice that the slope of the tangent line is equal to zero. That's the velocity of zero right here at this instant. And then as the object moves from here and begins to pass through the equilibrium position like so, it has a position of zero. But now on the position as a function of time graph, take a look at the slope of the tangent line. Notice that right there, the slope of the tangent line is its largest negative number. That's this quantity right here, negative a omega. And then the object moves from equilibrium to x equals minus a, and moves from equilibrium to x equals minus a. And now watch this. The velocity goes from negative a omega back to zero. The slope of the tangent line here is equal to zero, so the velocity goes from negative a omega to zero. And then the process just happens now in reverse. We go from x equals minus a back to equilibrium, x equals minus a back to equilibrium, and the velocity goes from zero to its largest positive value. Its largest positive value is positive a omega like so. And then lastly, the object goes from equilibrium back to x equals positive a, that is from here to here, and the velocity goes from positive a omega back to zero. 
positive a omega back to zero. This is the derivative of that. And then we just do this one more time now to describe acceleration. Once again, for those of you who have some experience in calculus, in order to find the acceleration as a function of time, all that we would do is differentiate the velocity as a function of time. But we can once again find the acceleration here by making this comparison between uniform circular motion and simple harmonic motion. Here's how we do. Okay, I'm going to do some erasing here, and I, by the way, encourage you to reconstruct this graph. Okay, let me get rid of this stuff here, like so. Okay, now what we'll do is we'll take a look at the acceleration. So right here at this point on the circle, recall that the centripetal acceleration vector a sub c points inwards towards the center of the circle. So that looks like this. Like so, right here in red is a sub c. But that's not what we want. Keep in mind that the oscillation occurs along the x-axis. So I have to take that a sub c vector and break it into components. So that's done like this. Here along the x-axis, and then here like so. If you then break up a sub c into these components as I've done, pretty obviously this angle right here is the angle theta. And then this is the component that we want, which is along the x-axis. Let's just refer to this as a. So that component a is equal to nothing more than the hypotenuse multiplied by the cosine of the angle. It does, however, point to the left-hand side of my diagram, opposite of what we were earlier calling positive. So then therefore I have to give it a negative sign like so. And then, once again, I want to write this quantity in terms of the quantities of uniform, not of uniform circular motion, excuse me, but of simple harmonic motion. So I'm going to replace the angle theta with, once again, omega t in just a few moments, but I also have to get rid of the a sub c, which is a description of uniform circular motion. Here's how I do that. Okay, recall from our unit on uniform circular motion that the centripetal acceleration is equal to the speed squared divided by the radius. Let's replace, however, the speed v naught with a omega from earlier, like so. And then if you simplify a little bit, you end up with this expression here. So I'm going to replace the a sub c with that, and I'm going to replace the theta here with omega t. When I do, I end up with my third expression. And that's this expression here. So once again, for those of you who have some experience in calculus, just jump back to the velocity as a function of time and differentiate. So the derivative of sine is cosine. Once again, take the derivative of what's in sine, you bring out another omega out in front, like so. So this is the derivative of that. And then ultimately, we can graph it out and relate it to the other two graphs through the derivatives. So here's then what we obtain. Okay, so now this is acceleration as a function of time. When I graph out the acceleration as a function of time, it's just a negative cosine curve. Okay, recall from math that the negative cosine curve looks like this. And then once again, this right here is one full oscillation, so this is the period capital T. And then these points here and here are once again not the amplitudes, instead they're the maximum accelerations. The maximum accelerations are the quantities a omega squared. They occur at the amplitude positions in the oscillation because that's when the spring force is the greatest value. So we have a positive value here and a negative value here, like so. And then lastly here, let's go ahead and relate all three graphs together, describing in full one complete oscillation in terms of derivatives. So as we've already seen, on a position as a function of time graph, the slope of the tangent line is the velocity, but now also recall the following. On a velocity as a function of time graph, the slope of the tangent line is the acceleration. So now here's one full oscillation. So we begin, first of all, at rest right here at t is equal to zero, and the position of the object is x equals positive a, like so. And then right here, the slope of the tangent line is equal to zero, the object begins at rest. However, now, on this graph, notice that the slope of the tangent line is its largest negative number. This is negative a omega squared. And then the object moves from x equals positive a to equilibrium. It moves from x equals positive a to equilibrium. And the velocity goes from zero to negative a omega. Zero to negative a omega. And now the acceleration goes from negative a omega squared to zero negative a omega squared 
to zero. And then the object goes from equilibrium to x equals minus a. So from equilibrium to x equals minus a, the velocity goes from negative a omega to zero, negative a omega to zero, and now the acceleration goes from zero to its largest positive value, positive a omega squared. So from zero to positive a omega squared. And then the whole process just happens in reverse. Now we go from x equals minus a back to equilibrium, so x equals minus a back to equilibrium, the velocity goes from zero to positive a omega, zero to positive a omega, and then the acceleration goes from a omega squared to zero, a omega squared to zero. And then lastly, we go from equilibrium back to x equals positive a. So from equilibrium back to x equals positive a, the velocity goes from a omega to zero, a omega to zero, and the acceleration goes from zero back to negative a omega squared. Zero to negative a omega squared. That is the derivative of that is the derivative of that. And that's all there is to it. We'll take a look at examples starting in the next video.